Now I have the pleasure of introducing this year's keynote speaker, John Porcari. John, who earned his MPA from Rockefeller College in 1985, is currently Senior Vice President and National Director of Strategic Consulting at Parsons Brinkerhoff, one of the world's leading professional services, planning, engineering, and construction firms. Prior to joining Pre Parsons Brinkerhoff, John was nominated by President Obama and unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate. If you know anything about federal politics these days, that's a small miracle. <laughs> to serve as Deputy Secretary of the United States Department of Transportation. In this position, he was responsible for the department's overall operations, which include 55,000 employees worldwide and a $77 billion operating budget. John twice served as Secretary of the Maryland Department of Transportation and as a Chief Financial Officer and Chief Operating Officer of the University of Maryland as well as a variety of economic development positions at the local and state government levels. In addition to being one of Rockefeller's most distinguished alumni, he also serves as a member of the college's advisory board. Please join me in welcoming John Porcari. Dean Rethmeyer, faculty and staff, parents, friends, and family, and a special welcome and congratulations to the 2015 graduates of the Rockefeller College. It's an honor to be with you here today. I come to you as a proud graduate of this program, and before that, a construction laborer, door-to-door -door environmental activist, DeLorean automobile salesman, and bookstore manager. In short, I'm living proof that this program can provide the tools for anyone to succeed. As you contemplate your futures with a vertigo-inducing blend of excitement and trepidation, I stand here in a very tenuous position between you, your diploma, and whatever carefully laid plans you have for tonight. So mindful of this, I'll observe the three Bs. Be brief, be clear, and be gone. <laughs> I come to you today as an emissary of a generation that bequeaths you a, a ruinous mountain of student debt, a constricted civil discourse, and the muffling blanket of cynicism about government, its obligations, and its fundamental role in enabling a better future for all. A generation that, in the aftermath of September 11, 2001, was not asked to sacrifice anything for the common good, that was instead asked to go shopping as a patriotic act. A generation that has embraced not governing as an explicit governing choice, that throws sand in the gears of government and then exults in pointing out its inefficiencies that has narrowed the definition of the common wheel to exclude fundamental equality of opportunity, that governs by exploiting our differences instead of our common destiny. So I'll truly understand if you don't think that I and my cohorts have the right to offer any advice. And yet I stand here with unquenchable optimism for the future. No national figure from my generation has called you to public service. No John Kennedy summoning a generation to the nobility of public service with the clarion call of ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And yet you are here. I can't tell you what will make you happy. Let me instead briefly relate to you what gives me great professional satisfaction in the hope that it will help crystallize your thoughts. And I promise you can get out those selfie sticks in exactly 11 minutes. <laughs> Since leaving these halls, I've had the great good fortune of working in one of the most tangible aspects of public administration infrastructure. Good, bad, or ugly, you can't avoid transportation infrastructure. You know when it works, and you definitely know when it doesn't. It's ubiquitous, yet generally invisible when it works right, and is a shared source of frustration and rage when it doesn't. It's the literal building blocks of our children's and their children's future prosperity and quality of life. It's a generational transfer of optimism to the future. And it has been since the founding days of the Republic. Just miles from here, Clinton's big ditch, an object of scorn, became the Erie Canal, which fueled the explosive growth of upstate New York and opened the West. And if you feel sorry for yourself and the tough choices of today, put yourself in President Lincoln's shoes. While fighting an existential, bloody battle to preserve the Union, Lincoln took the time and effort to focus on building a transcontinental railroad that would literally bind the nation together. In the darkest days of the Great Depression, the Hoover Dam and Golden Gate Bridge built a direct path to a brighter future. And most recently, 
the $48 billion of Recovery Act projects that we undertook during the Great Recession in 2009 to jumpstart the economy and get the nation back on its feet will be serving your grandchildren. That is the power of infrastructure to me. The visionary, ambitious projects that affirm our faith in a better tomorrow. And I'm pleased to tell you that even a DeLorean salesman can pick up a few practical lessons along the way, things they can't teach you here in the program. I want to briefly share two of them through examples. During my first tour as Secretary of Transportation for the State of Maryland, we had a $2.4 billion project to replace the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, which is I-95 over the Potomac River. It was a big, complicated project, and it was a series of political near-death experiences for me as Secretary. But we decided early on that it could be much more than a bridge project. We used this as an opportunity to build a local employment program for skilled trades like welding. We used the new bridge structure itself to build a bike trail over the Potomac linking Maryland and Virginia. And we committed $100 million of the project funding to begin the cleanup of the Anacostia River, the region's most polluted waterway. The point is we didn't have to do these things. We could have just built a bridge and called it a day. But the community asked, and looking back, these enhancements are the part of the project that I'm proudest of. So that's lesson one. Think broadly about how to accomplish more than one policy goal at a time. It'll force cooperation, imagination, and better outcomes. And chances are you can use transportation monies to help your community in innovative ways. Another great lesson for me took place at the national level. President Obama's then Chief of Staff, Rahm Emanuel, told us, never let a crisis go to waste. As it turns out, that's when a lot of the policy innovation takes place. From President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's bold, persistent experimentation during the New Deal to the Great Recession, crisis drives innovation. In this example, a talented and dedicated team invented and implemented a Cash for Clunkers program as part of the stimulus program in 2009. It immediately took 700,000 older, high emissions vehicles off the road and jump-started a dying auto industry. Over two million jobs were at stake. We, all of us, including me, we're literally processing cash for clunkers vouchers on tables in the atrium of the DOT building in Washington, but we got it done. That sense of urgency and immediacy sweeps away the clutter of accreted policies, beliefs, and norms. It clears the field for nimble, smart programs and policies. At the same time, we also started a merit-based grant competition for transportation projects that replaced the congressional earmark process. You know, the one that brought us the infamous Bridge to Nowhere in Alaska. This program was designed on the fly by employees volunteering from every corner of our department. Aviation, transit, pipeline safety, railroads, you name it. And together, in a matter of weeks, they built a nationwide program that includes benefit cost analysis and is now the national gold standard for a merit-based project selection process. So lesson two is use any crisis, in this case an economic crisis, as an inflection point to simultaneously drive policy innovation. What seemed impossible before is suddenly possible in a crisis. Cooperation, innovation, progress. Find like-minded souls and get going. Okay, we're down to the two-minute warning, folks. Theodore Roosevelt said, the credit goes to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best, if he wins, knows the thrill of high achievement, and if he fails, at least fails by daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. And so I found myself, as if by accident, seated in the Roosevelt Room in the West Wing of the White House, which, by the way, is named after both Theodore and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Is across the hall from the Oval Office. On my left hung Teddy Roosevelt's Congressional Medal of Honor for charging San Juan Hill. On my right, his Nobel Peace Prize for brokering an end to the Russo-Japanese War. It was pretty sobering. And as I pushed back the persistent throbbing in, my, in the back of my head that kept insisting, why are you here? I looked around at my administration colleagues seated around the table, and I began to understand. I knew that there was a place for me in that long line of public servants who had sat in the same chair in that very room, no doubt also secretly wondering whether they belong there, 
and who then turned to the matter at hand. And through their hard work, they left our nation a little better than they found it. And in that same way, you know why you're here. As of today, you are in that arena that Teddy Roosevelt so vividly described. Let your drive for serving others, that same passion for giving back that brought you to this program and this point in your life, propel you forward in a career that gives you that higher satisfaction. Congratulations, good luck, and Godspeed.